All right, church, it is time to get started. It is a beautiful day over here in the eastern part of the state. I hope that things are going well west of us over in the middle part of the state, but it's time to talk about Jesus. Today we are going to be looking at the Gospel of John. This is a story that the other Gospel writers put at the end of Jesus' life, but John, uh, for reasons that we'll talk about a little bit today, puts it at the beginning of Jesus' life. Either way, it fits into this theme that we have been talking about for the past few weeks in the season of Lent where Jesus and the tensions between he and the religious leaders are rising. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He is uh, marching toward his cross as the conflict begins to build. And so the story we have today is at the end of John chapter 2, or in John chapter 2 rather. It is right after his um, attendance at the wedding festival in Cana where he converts water to wine. And uh, we will talk about why John, I think, throws those two stories together as we go. But for right now, let's, let's go ahead and just read the story. This is John chapter 2, starting in verse 14. This is um, as Jesus comes out of the wedding in Cana. Then he goes to Jerusalem for the Passover. And he's in Jerusalem beginning in verse 14. It says, And he found in the temple courts those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated. And he made a whip of cords and drove them all out of the temple courts, both the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to the one selling the doves, he said, take these things away from here. Do not make my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us because you are doing these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, This temple has been under construction 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the saying that Jesus had spoken. And now, while Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name because they saw his signs which he was doing. But Jesus himself did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and because he did not need anyone to testify about man, for he himself knew what was in man. And so we have Jesus going to Jerusalem at the Passover. He goes into the temple, and once he goes into the temple, there in the outer courts, as people are going in to worship, the uh, money changers and the merchants are set up. And basically, to understand what is going on here, first, you need to understand that, um, and if you grew up in Bible class, you probably have already heard this, this is just review, but when you went to the temple to worship, that involves sacrifice, and if you were going to make a sacrifice, you needed to have something to sacrifice, and oftentimes, that was a problematic thing for worshipers, especially if you were going to travel over a great distance. It was cumbersome, it was troublesome to bring your sacrifice with you. Um, if you were poor and you really didn't have anything to spare um, that can make that sort of distance, there were all sorts of problems involved in this. And so the, um, the merchants and the money changers, they decided that they would make things convenient for you. Not debating whether or not this morning that was necessarily a good move in and of itself, but they decided they would make things convenient for you. You don't have to bring your sacrifice with you. You don't have to make the sacrifice of selecting it from your flock because um, we will sell you an acceptable sacrifice once you get there right outside the temple. But over time what happened was this became, um, and it may have been a problematic thing to begin with. Like I said, we're not going to get into that this morning. What happened at the end of the day though was that um, this became an oppressive system. It became a system that was built on greed and opportunism, which may have been, again, what it was all along. Uh, the money changers, for instance, were there because uh, as you came into the temple area, just any old money wouldn't do. You had to use a particular kind of money, the sort of money that was acceptable in the temple. And so the money changers were there to exchange your unacceptable money for their acceptable money at a modest rate of course. And then when you bought your sacrifice inside the temple courts, the problem was, of course, that they could charge whatever they wanted to. You would come to the temple. You were there to worship. You didn't have an animal to sacrifice in the worship. And so you didn't have a lot of options. And so they would charge whatever they wanted to. Basically, if you've ever been to a theme park or some sort of an attraction and you had to buy food on the inside, 
say a, a Coke at Disney or a sandwich at Dollywood and you've seen the prices that they charge or popcorn at the movie theater even, you understand the economics behind the situation. And so it became an opportunity for profit for uh, those who ran the money exchange tables and sold the sacrifices. It became an opportunity of oppression for those who came just to worship God and they didn't have a lot to begin with and their life was already hard to begin with. These people were sticking it to them. And so the temple had kind of been turned on its head. The temple was, uh, uh, those in the temple were losing the perspective of what they were supposed to be there for. And so Jesus comes into the temple and he sees all of these people being taken advantage of, all of these people who were profiting off of the worship of God, all of these people who had turned God's house, a place that was supposed to be a light in the midst of the world, God's presence in the midst of his creation, a foretaste of what God would do for all of creation one day, and they had turned it into an opportunity for greed and for manipulation and oppression. And so Jesus, and John points to that scripture in the Old Testament where he will be consumed by zeal. Jesus being consumed by zeal, being zealous, I can't pronounce that word this morning, uh, Jesus being zealous for um, God and his agenda and his ways in the world and the way that God is seen in the world. He braids a cord, and, or he braids a whip of cords rather, and he begins to drive out the livestock. And we kind of want to understand here, this is kind of a side note, but I almost feel obligated to do this. Uh, this was not Jesus lashing out in anger. This was not Jesus lashing out in rage. This was not Jesus attacking those who um, were selling the animals. The text is relatively clear in John and in others that he used the whip to drive out the animals. That's how one drove animals in those days. They used a whip to kind of prod them along their way, it doesn't say anything that he beat the uh, the seller, the sellers, those who ran the marketplace, anything like that. And what's more, uh, for those who want to take this up today to justify their violence and their treatment of others, um, this statement that Jesus makes through driving out the livestock, flipping over the tables, it would have been seen as more symbolic than an actual violent threat, because particularly at the Passover, there were Roman troops all around because they knew the propensity for rebellion and revolution and revolt to kind of rise up during the Passover time. They would have been watching and anything that they perceived as an actual threat, actual violence, they would have stopped that quickly. So whatever Jesus did, Jesus was making a statement. Jesus wasn't beating on people in a rage, but what Jesus was doing was he was through prophetic action. Uh, the pro prophets in the Old Testament would do this sort of thing often. Isaiah would do this sort of thing. Jeremiah would do this sort of thing. Ezekiel would do this sort of thing. They would, they would act out a kind of a performance piece, a prophetic message for the people of God. Jesus comes into the temple. He sees the corruption. He sees the um, oppression. He sees the manipulation. He sees the greed. He sees all of the ways that the house of God, this light in the middle of the world, the presence of God being subverted, being distorted and manipulated. And in his statement, driving out the animals, flipping over the tables, getting on to those who were there, the statement he makes is, this is not who God is. This is not who God is. And then he makes it worse because those who are there, this is the way they had always done things. Of course, this is who God is. This is how God's temple works. How else would it work? They demand from him. We, we demand a sign since you're doing these things. What sort of sign, authenticity or authority are you going to give us because you do these things? And he said, here is your sign. If you tear down this temple, I will build it back in three days. And of course, they interpreted that in terms of the temple that they were inside of, the building that had been um, constructed that was still under construction for a period of decades, nearly 50 years. And they said, we've been working on this a long time now. You suppose that if it's torn down, you can build it back in three days? But of course, John, looking back on it with hindsight, he says that what Jesus was really talking about was the temple of his body. And what Jesus was saying, although nobody got it yet, but he was saying it for the benefit of those who would come later and they would put those pieces together, which is what John talks about in the text, is 
is that not only is uh, Jesus confronting the way that the establishment had come to perceive God, selling the livestock at whatever cost or uh, exchanging money, making a profit, opportunism, oppression in the temple. Not only did Jesus confront that, but he confronted the very notion of the temple. He redefines the temple. It is not the building they are standing in, but he is the light in the darkness. He is the presence of God in the world. He is the foretaste of um, what God intends for all of creation at the end. Jesus is the temple the text teaches us, not the building in Jerusalem. And so he begins to reconfigure, he begins to challenge, he begins to confront things. And this entire section through here, really um, John's entire gospel, but powerfully in John chapter 2, what John is doing is he is giving us insight into what God is like. Jesus begins his ministry at a party at a celebration of life at the beginning of the chapter is an entire community, a small rural community gathers around to celebrate the joining of husband and wife. And they party. They celebrate. They, they have a feast. And Jesus in that story, he um, assumes the role of host and provides wine so that that party can continue going. God joins in the celebration and then going to Jerusalem where the true celebration is supposed to happen. This is the Passover. This is the token of God's life being brought into the world. This is the time where they remember their deliverance and their formation as God's people to, to be the light of the world. This is the high point of their year, or at least one of the high points of their year. He finds corruption and oppression and opportunism, and so he flips over tables. This is not who God is. John is teaching us what God looks like, because remember, in the Gospel of John, the theme running throughout it all is Jesus shows us what God looks like. And for our purposes, as we're going through the story of Jesus this year, there's a very important question hanging in the balance here as we confront this Jesus. And this is the question that um, this is a question they faced in the first century as well, as Jesus started flipping over tables and he started driving animals out. Jesus is going to inevitably, this was true for them, it's going to be true for us too, he is going to inevitably redefine for us who God is and what God looks like. There are going to be these statements, these moments in our life where Jesus is going to say always, this is what God looks like, and this is not what God looks like. And sometimes that's going to come as a, a message of good news. It's going to be a blessing. I am so thankful in this moment that God is this kind of God, and God is not this kind of God. And sometimes, like if you were a money changer in the courts of the temple, or if you were selling sacrifices in the courts of the temple, or you were in charge of the way things ran in the courts of the temple, um, that disruptive message... God is like this. God is not like this. That disruptive message is going to come as an affront. And when it comes as an affront, we um, are in a very important position to make a decision. Are we, and you see kind of a mixed message in John, some people fall on either side of this decision, are we going to allow Jesus to redefine who God is for us? Are we going to let Jesus confront the false images of God that we have in our mind, repent, and turn toward the true God that he is revealing in our lives? Or are we going to insist on that lesser God that we have always known? Whenever we come to one of these situations, this is what's going on for Jesus. He is making a clear statement in Jerusalem, in the temple, where this is just the way things were. This is just how God works. This is who God is. He comes in and he says, this is not who God is. And so they had to decide. They had to make a choice. And one of the reasons this season of confrontation in Jesus' life is, is um, so stark, is so strong is because Jesus forces us into these sorts of decisions. When he reveals to us that God is not who we always thought he was, who we've 
always thought he was. Are we going to let go of the old and hang on to the new? Or are we going to insist on the old? That's what hangs in the balance. And so Jesus offers this choice before them, and they have to make a decision. Jesus offers this choice before us, and we have to make a decision. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop there. That is a fun text, uh, but let's pray. And I'm going to turn you loose on the world, and I pray that you would think about that this week as you look at Jesus as you look at who he is and how he reveals God when he confronts us with a God who is not like the God that we thought he was um, which way will we go let's pray Lord we thank you for loving us we thank you for giving us Jesus we thank you for showing us who you are in Jesus Lord Help us to see you through him more clearly. And any time anything gets in the way of seeing you, give us the courage to walk right past it toward you. And we come and we pray as a family. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Church, we love you. We hope that we can see you soon. I know we're working toward that. But we miss you until then. I hope you guys have a good week. Go be the presence of Jesus.